Hi, Live Group Leaders. Today we wrap up our unit of numbers in Deuteronomy. Besides going over the passage for today in chapters 32 and 34, I've included a summary statement over our entire study in numbers in Deuteronomy at the end of the video, and maybe that's how you want to wrap up everything with your class because our passage today is fairly straightforward. Before we get into what it actually covers, uh, I want to talk about how we arrived at this final passage today. In chapter 31 and most of chapter 32, Moses sings a song to the people of Israel. It's the aptly titled Song of Moses. And it is a song that Moses gave to and taught the people before he was going to die to help them remember God's faithfulness and to thereby be encouraged. The song's subject is God. Its theme is God's faithfulness, and its purpose was to encourage Israel to remember God's greatness. It's no small coincidence that this is the purpose of many of the songs that we sing today. And then we get to our reading this week which begins with the announcement of Moses' death in chapter 32. Now, if you've been following along with us, this is nothing new because we learned about this back in Numbers chapter 20. Uh, we read, that very same day, the same day that Moses gave this song to Israel, God directed him to prepare for his death. Mount Nebo, where he was supposed to ascend and die, is one of the peaks in the Abara mountain range that stands east of the Arabah, northeast of the Dead Sea. It's basically a, a hilltop that overlooks the valley the Jordan River flows through and then across to the other mountains to the west that is the land of Israel. I think one of the reasons why Moses went is, is instructed to go up is because people in the ancient Near East associate heights with nearness to God. And his brother was buried on top of a mountain and Maybe that's why God asked Moses to go up on the mountain too, is to symbolize his nearness to God. And as he was going up there, God permitted Moses to see the entire land of Canaan at a distance, even though his sin at Meribah prevented him from entering it. And so then we go to chapter 34, which is the death of Moses. God instructed Moses to climb the mountain to view the promised land and Moses had already been told he would not allow to enter because of his sin. And although Moses pleads with God to reconsider, ultimately he humbly accepted the Lord's decision not to allow him to enter the land of Canaan. The place where Moses died on top of the mountain is important because, one, it allowed him to see the promised land from that vantage point that high up. But two, it also uh, is symbolic of the place where Moses began his walk with God. At Mount Sinai is where God called Moses 40 years earlier to come up and meet with him. And I think there's something symbolic of that. Moses, come back up on this mountain here with me one more time. Furthermore, God informed Moses that he would die while he was on top of Mount Nemo. And this might seem strange because, as the Bible indicates, that despite being old, Moses is strong and in good health. And then it leads to the discussion of, well, how exactly did Moses die? Because unlike with Aaron, Moses went up to the mountain alone. No one actually saw him die. We don't know. Maybe he had a heart attack. Maybe he had a stroke. But whatever the case, his appointed time came and Moses died. And the unique aspect of the story is that Moses knew he was going to die on the mountain before he went up. And yet, rather than cowering or being afraid or, I don't want to go, he just went up the mountain and he faced his death with courage. And so what are we to learn from God's decision to keep Moses out of the promised land? Well, I think the first thing is there are consequences to our sin. Moses had a 40-year investment in God's uh, mission, which included the delivery of Israel from Egypt, uh, dozens of miracles, and countless face-to-face -face interactions with God. But that did not exempt him from the fate that inevitably strikes all of us, because Moses failed to submit to the one and only God who both gives life and takes it. Christopher J. H. Wright wrote in his commentary, The depth of the pain and disappointment that the divine refusal caused Moses can be seen in the number of times he refers to it. So even if he stopped talking to God about it, and Deuteronomy chapter 3, verse 26, suggests he had been making a persistent request, 
He didn't stop reminding the Israelites of it. Essentially, because of you, God was angry with me. The exclusion of Moses from entering the promised land figures so largely here in this passage and was probably as much a surprise to the original readers as it is to us that it invites some reflection. The second thing I think we can take out of this is that God always holds leaders to higher standards. Remember from Numbers 20 that Moses would suffer this fate because he and his brother broke faith with God in the presence of the Israelites at the waters of Meribah. Their offense was not wholesale rebellion, but it was, it was an act of impatience and it was an act of not giving God his due. Still, because spiritual leaders incur stricter judgment, Moses would see the land only from a distance. And while this may seem unduly harsh with Moses, remember that the punishment was fair and fitting. Just like our discussion in Numbers 20, we learn that God is never unjust. R.C. Sproul said it this way, Suppose ten people sin, and sin equally. Suppose God punishes five of them, and is merciful on the other five. Is this injustice? No. In this situation, five people get justice, and five people get mercy. No one gets injustice. God is not obliged to treat all people equally, and we must remember that mercy is always voluntary. As God said, I will have mercy on whom I will have mercy. So we're tracking along in chapter 34, and, and then we get to the burial at verse 6. In the story of Aaron's death, three men ascended Mount Hor together, but only two of them returned. In this case, Moses went up Mount Nebo alone. No one was there with them, and this raises another question that people would have asked. What happened to Moses' body when he died? The Bible clearly states that God buried Moses. This is peculiar and a special occurrence to think that God himself personally did this. Furthermore, the scriptures indicate that no one knows where the body of Moses was buried. In other words, God buried him in an unmarked grave, which could not and has not been found. Why would he do such a thing? Well, a lot of scholars think that God didn't want people to find his body because they would probably build a monument or even a shrine for Moses and worship Moses. And God was aware of the people's tendency to chase after idols and didn't want Moses' grave to be tainted in such a way. Nevertheless, many of the circumstances surrounding his death and burial remain a mystery. Adding to this peculiar mystery is in the book of Jude. In verse 9, we read that following Moses' death, the archangel Michael and Satan contended over the body of Moses. It's uncertain exactly what they were arguing about or why the devil would want Moses' body. While it's somewhat unclear, this dispute definitely highlights the importance of Moses and all that he did for the Lord's people. The Bible never states that Satan wanted anyone else's body, so Moses must have been a pretty big deal. In the end, God denied Satan's request, instead burying Moses himself at an undisclosed location. And that brings us to the end of chapter 34, his legacy. Following the death and burial of Moses, the children of Israel mourned his loss for 30 days. Again, we are left to wonder how they knew that he died. Perhaps he told Joshua or someone that before he climbed up the mountain that he would not be coming back. In any event, after their period of grieving, Joshua was named the new leader of Israel. Moses had already designated Joshua to take over after his death. And if you want to know what happens next in the story, I would ask you to read the book of Joshua. The Bible pays tribute to Moses in several ways. It states that no prophet like Moses has ever risen in Israel again. He knew God face to face, meaning that he enjoyed the personal and immediate presence of God in a way that no other prophet did. In addition, God worked through Moses to perform many of the greatest miracles in the history of Israel, such as the ten plagues of Egypt and the parting of the Red Sea. Moses is held up through scripture as one of the greatest prophets. As we conclude our straightforward study of the death and burial of Moses, I want you to think about something with me. Roughly 1,500 years after the Exodus ended, in the weeks before Jesus' death, the transfiguration of Christ took place on a mountaintop. Now, we don't know exactly what mountaintop it is, but many scholars believe that it's Mount Tabor, which is in the boundaries of Israel. 
And we read this about this miraculous event in the Gospels. Who was present there? Well, Jesus, a few of his disciples, Elijah, and, you guessed it, Moses. If, if you hold to the Mount Tamor location, Moses ultimately got to enter the Promised Land in the company of Jesus, no less. Furthermore, he, along with all the other saints, will be present in New Jerusalem at the end of the age. Moses will experience for the ages to come what he only saw from a distance nearing his death. And like Moses, we too have been called to come and die. Maybe not literally, but we have been called to come and die. We too can boldly climb the mountains before us and embrace God's will. No matter what might be, we can say yes to him, knowing that when we do, he will advance his kingdom in mighty ways. Now I know we have to be careful equating the covenant we have in Christ to the Mosaic covenant. They aren't the same, but God is the same. And like Moses, we too can catch a glimpse of our promised land. By studying the Bible, we can develop a vision of heaven. And though we may not be able to enter our eternal home yet, the view looks pretty good. We can rest in the hope that we will be there someday soon. I want to wrap up our entire study of numbers in Deuteronomy, maybe to give you just kind of a wrap-up point before we launch in to our study of Romans. One of the great messages of the Bible is that God desires to bless people through a relationship with himself. And the message of the Pentateuch, or that's just a word that essentially is the first five books of the Bible, the message of the Pentateuch is that people can experience this blessing through trust and obedience. Each of the first five books reveal an important truth concerning God, humanity, and our relationship with Him. We know from our study in Numbers that it illustrated by Israel's example how redeemed sinners can enjoy the benefits of atonement and yet fail to trust and obey God. The outstanding characteristic of God in Numbers is His graciousness towards sinful human beings. God disciplines his own in order to teach them to obey him, because only then can they experience all the blessings that he wants them to enjoy. Deuteronomy pictures a redeemed man as a vassal or a servant, and God as a lord or a master. This relationship exists, this relationship exists by virtue of who God is, that he is creator and he is redeemer, and who man is, that we are a creature and that we are fallen. Deuteronomy reveals that God loves people and that they should love God. This relationship is not a formal and personal one, but one where the love motivates and sustains it. God manifested his love for Israel in the laws that he gave her. Israel was to demonstrate love for God by her obedience to his laws. And these laws were in the Mosaic Covenant. And God designed them to bring Israel into as close as a relationship to himself as possible. The Pentateuch contains all the instruction necessary for the Israelites to enjoy an intimate, loving relationship with God. In the historical books that follow, we see how the principles revealed in the Pentateuch either worked out or didn't work out for Israel in her history. The Israelites' degree of trust and obedience determined this. God intended their example to be instructive for us. The same principles apply today. Though the covenant and laws under which we live are different than those which Abraham and Moses lived. So that's our conclusion to our study of Numbers in Deuteronomy. You may want to come up with some questions just to ask your life group about what has been meaningful to them in this study. What is something that they learned about themselves or their faith or God that they didn't necessarily know before we looked at these Two books that honestly don't receive a lot of attention because they take a lot of work to understand what's going on. But then you could also ask specific questions about just our passage today. And that's what I've lined up here for you to help your class belong, believe, and become in a community that helps them become fully formed disciples of Jesus. Belong questions this week. Moses was asked to climb a mountain where he was told he was going to die. That's a pretty scary thought. What's the scariest thing you've ever done? How did you get through it? Believe questions this week. God told Moses to go to the place where he would die. How was he able to obey this command? How do you think you would respond to such a command? Why wasn't Moses allowed to enter the promised land? And what can we learn from this? And finally, our become questions. As a group, compile a short list of some of God's promises to you. How do these promises give you hope for the present? 
how do they give you hope for the future? How does it make you feel to know that even closer relationship with God than what Moses enjoyed awaits you? How should this shape how we live? So that's all that I've got. We're done with numbers in Deuteronomy. Many of you are rejoicing. I'm going to be kind of sad to see it go, but I am excited about our study for Romans that will begin next week. Life group leaders, what you do is so important. Just the fact that you tether our our people to a community that loves them. Uh, you know, your pastoral staff, we can't reach everybody all the time. There's just way too many of our sheep and you you're you stand in that gap and you intercede for our people and you love them and you teach them God's word what you do is vital not just for our church but it's vital for the kingdom of God so I appreciate you I love you if there's anything you need please let me know I'm praying for you Godspeed